Ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you very much for your attention and uh, for your introduction, Chairman. Now, uh, I would like to give you a small perspective of a country of Mongolia, how it's been impacted by the climate change and not only been impacted, but how we would like, how we're dealing with that. Now, um, so I just, Mongolia is a country with a large territory. It's the 17th, I think, in the territory wise, the, la the largest territory in the world, but the population is only three, we will be reaching three million population later on this year. And this is an example of a country that has been disproportionately affected by the climate change. Now, um, there are different climate risks, risk indexes, and one of these uh, studies by an organization called German Watch Studies is ranking Mongolia as one of the top 15 with the climate risks. And if you look at the climate change and projections in Mongolia, um, actually, we're three times more intensely warmed up than the global average. So the measurements in Mongolia for uh, weather and climate started in 1940s. So since 1940s, our, um, uh, it's 2.14 degrees Celsius is increasing the annual air mean temperatures and the amount of precip precipitation is slightly decreasing. So we know that the global average is about 0.7, so it's three times more intensely warmed up and it's because of our weather conditions and uh, you know our geographic location and topography and other things. Now, <coughs> it's a small population, but still one fourth of the population live as semi-nomadic herders and their livestock uh, is grazed off the natural pastures. And that's why when uh, drier climate, um, warmer climate, ends up in um, pasture degradation and desertification, it's actually affecting the lives of those nom semi-nomadic herders directly. Um, so one of the main manifestations of climate change in Mongolia is, as I said, dry drier climate, desertification, pasture degradation a bit, but also we see glaciers melting and also permafrost thawing as well. So. Um, there is uh, more areas that are affected by desertification. Um, there are some measurements for glaciers and they show that since 1940s, about 28% of the glacier cover was melted. Um, permafrost also thawing and that will potentially loosen up the soil, which is not a very good idea in the long term. And um, dust and sandstorms uh, what our South Korean and Japanese neighbors will know as yellow dust, which they've been affected by uh, some of the impacts as well. And um, so I talked about the animal husbandry. Of course, it's affecting some of our wild animals and biodiversity. Um, just for your interest, there is a, in our southern part of Mongolia, there is a Gobi Desert region and we have our distinct species called um, Mazala bear, and only about 30 or so species are left. And uh, black-tailed gazelles numbers are going down. Of course, they were impacted. So what do we, what do we have been doing about that? As our chairman and uh, Lord Prescott was mentioning, it's very important to have legislations right at the country and national level. So we passed the uh, climate change legislation initially in 2000 and uh, we uh, did it in 2011. And National Action Program on Climate Change has all sorts of uh, targets. But those, what those targets mean for us, uh, we translated them into something called Green Development Strategy. So um, the new government, which was created a year and a half ago, uh, restructured the Ministry of Environment to Minister of Environment and Green Development. The idea is that our development and economic growth that we're currently experiencing, we want to move from, from brown economy to green economy. So um, there is a um, green economy strategy paper that is tabled to the parliament and we're hoping to get it approved in April during this spring session. And um, you can imagine that uh, 
in Mongolia, uh, some of you may know, Mongolia has been experiencing uh, one of the fastest economic growth, not only in the region, but also in the world. Because it's a small economy, because of the commodity boom and mining boom, all of a sudden in the last six, seven years, our economic growth is anything from 8 to 17%. Last year it was about 12%. This year we're expecting 14% of economic growth. But um, we don't want this economic growth to uh, be the same old model where you develop now and clean up later. So it's not only Mongolia. I know many emerging countries, uh, many growing economies, has been aspiring for greener growth. We know South Korea's green growth strategy. Kazakhstan has started so-called Green Bridge initi Initiative and Green Economy uh, strategy as well. Ethiopia, we yesterday heard about climate uh, resilient green growth roadmap. Uh, China has announced their ecological civilization plans, and I think there is a good political will. So it's a historical chance to turn this will into greener path. And um, whereas for the last maybe 15 years or so, um, for Mongolia it was about surviving from transition from communist country to market economy to democracy. It was about survival and nobody could think about green and environmentally friendly growth. Now that the economy is growing very fast, I think it's a historical unique chance to get the investments into schools, infrastructure, hospitals, all these new buildings, new roads and railroads to get it right and have green elements, uh, climate resilient infrastructure into those. And unless we do it right now, uh, we will be regretting 20 years later. So I think it's very important, not only north-south cooperation, but also south-south cooperation. And there is, when there is this political will, we're looking for uh, cooperation and for the knowledge how to design, plan correctly with those infrastructure and public investment needs. So how, how do we make sure that those buildings are built now in a green way rather than the old brown way, and we have to retrofit them uh, 20 years later. So um, uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.